this is the final presentation in this particular module and I absolutely love Gothic architecture. Um, I post a lot of videos beneath this one to keep me from getting too caught up in it, but just want to preface this by saying that Gothic architecture is absolutely incredible stuff. So we're looking at a map that's similar to the previous maps that we've been looking at. Uh, this one is a little bit more stable though. <clears throat> by unifying Europe uh, and making Christianity uh, one large consistent power, uh, you've given them access to a lot of resources that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, a lot of what they do with these resources is make buildings, really nice impressive buildings. Now, this particular chapel, uh, this is an abbey church of Saint Denis, which is in Paris, and uh, it's an abbey church and not a basilica. A basilica is a church that specifically houses a bishop. Um, if you're not a bishop, then it's just an abbey church or a monastery. It's some smaller uh, status church, uh, but there's supposed to be one bishop in an area who's like the uh, commissioner or whatever of a specific region. Um, Saint Denis, however, Saint Denis is the patron saint of France, uh, and the abbot who ran this, this particular abbey, Abbot Suget, uh, had a little bit more clout with the Pope than most abbots do, so he got a little bit of special treatment on this one. Um, Saint Denis uh, was built as an older style basilica, basilica church, which is primarily just a rectangular floor plan. Um, the problem with this is that uh, it doesn't make a good pilgrimage church. And at this time, what people are looking for uh, is almost like tourist attractions. Um, because of the stability that was introduced by unifying the Holy Roman Empire, you've got a lot of people that are traveling around Europe uh, basically looking for places to stop and pray. You know, there, there are several pilgrimage destinations. You could go uh, into Spain. Um, you could go back to Rome and see St. Peter's Basilica. Um, Paris is actually a pilgrimage destination. But there are multiple places that you could, you know, leave from and go to. But it's expected that you're going to stop and pray at multiple points in time throughout the day. And if you've got a really, really nice church, then people are going to hear about it and they're going to have to stop and go see it. Now, St. Denis knew that the original uh, abbey church that was there was not all that good. So he went to the bishop, went to the pope personally, and requested some, some new construction. And what they got was a really, really impressive structure that actually became the first official example of Gothic architecture. Now, this doesn't look like it's all that much of a technological leap to us today because we're used to seeing like really vibrant light interiors with a lot of open space. But at the time, uh, structures with floor plans that are this open with this much natural light is really something that would have been unusual. If you add on to that uh, the fact that stained glass is showing up in architecture for the first time ever, I, what you're beginning to introduce is a context that's basically transcendent. Um, the experience that you could have just walking into a structure like this is completely different than anything that you that, that the average person of the you know 12, 13, 14th century would have been, been able to experience anywhere else. Um, if you also consider that during mass, during official ceremonies, um, you'll have uh, people carrying thuribles, the, the sensors that would um, fill the room with, with you know, good smelling smokes. Um, the, the light from the window would be casting these colorful beams through the smoke and onto the floor and onto the walls and onto the parishioners. Um, you'd have uh, not only um, the Gregorian chant was still present during this time period, you would have people... Um, reciting the Mass. In addition to that, uh, there were halfway decent pipe organs at the time. Almost all of these are things that would you would, it was an, ex, an experience that was almost completely exclusive to 
the church itself. You know, if you're trying to convince somebody that they're in the presence of God, that is an absolutely great way to do it. In fact, um, at the beginning of the Gothic period, it was really common to have your priest sort of concealed behind a screen so that at no point during the ceremony would you actually see the priest. What you were hearing was, in fact, the word of God. You know, like there were no holds barred. This was this was the church trying to trying to convince you um, the majesty and power uh, that was available through these religious experiences. Um, can't imagine what it would have been like just in that historical period to experience something in this context. It had to have been mind blowing. Anyway, let's move forward, and we'll skip that. Uh, the most important part of the architecture that was added, uh, at least the floor plan during the uh, Gothic period, is the part that runs right here through the middle. Let me zoom in on that. It's called the transept. Now, the transept was an addition to what would have been just normally the a basilica style church would have already had this sort of uh, rectangular orientation. Uh, it would have had a large nave, probably would have had a choir and an apse. The apse is where the actual uh, altar is, where the priest would stand. The transept allows you to add another entry and exit way here and another entry and exit way here. In addition to that, and all these little squares along the sides here, that's room for private chapels. These private chapels were typically bought by wealthy families, and that's how you would afford to be able to, to renovate the churches, to add all these sections onto it. And it wasn't uncommon for uh, a bishop or a, an abbot to uh feel that their church needed to be upgraded and maybe one night a mysterious fire erupts in the choir when maybe a choir was exactly what that bishop needed built uh, there were a lot of just spontaneous fires that took place during this period when when building a very impressive church which is really really good for your status as a figure and for your status as a church it's a really big deal so the, but the transept so that's uh, that's going to be one of the key terms I, not only does it let people in and out, but it's also a walkway to get people around the church to see all of the altars around the side. But it's a big contribution. It added a lot. All right, let's see what we got next. All right. All right, so this is the interior of Chartres Cathedral. I'm not even going to try to put the, the French inflection on that. I'm bad at it. But where we're standing at now is behind the nave, as if we have just stepped into the church. Um, there's an entryway. Uh, like a foyer area that's called a narthex. Once you walk past that narthex, you're at the back of the nave. And this is where the audience would have been seated primarily. That teeny tiny little gold spot up there is a very large altar. So you would have a pope, I mean a priest, I'm sorry, that, that would be up here, and he would be yelling at the top of his lungs as an attempt to get everybody to hear what was being said. But the odds are, uh, if you were in the back, then it was probably just a lot of noise for you, but I don't think that necessarily killed the experience. And I'm actually just now noticing here, there's a little seat here. In every structure in France, be it Gothic, Romanesque, or otherwise, you're going to find one of these little seats that's designated specifically for the king himself, just in case he happened to have attended a, a, a sermon, what do they call it, a, well, a mass, um, that he would have have a, have a special seat available, even though most of these were never used. They were there just just as an in-case type of thing. But just look how tall and thin this building is compared to what we've seen in Romanesque structures. So like that's explained a lot more in the the corresponding videos. Now, looking at this thing from the exterior, most important part for you to notice here are these big round windows above the primary entrances to the buildings. These are called rose windows. There's another one on this side. because There's another entrance and exit over there. These rose windows uh, where were the crown jewel of the stained glass for the cathedral. Um, that's the part that would really draw people in. And from the interior, these things really do look pretty incredible. That's, this is, those are the same, that's the same rose window from the inside. And see, from the outside, it doesn't contribute a whole lot, but when you see the light passing through it, 
it is highly decorative, but beyond it being decorative, each one of these little panels conveys uh, an icon or a biblical narrative. Uh, it's some reference to the Bible itself. A well-organized cathedral would actually have um, their stained glass mirrors ordered according to the Gospels so that uh, a priest might be able to reference a specific section of the stained glass uh, as a means of providing a visual reference to the people. And you can also tell right, the original stained glass is made up of these teeny tiny little panels. Um, not all stained glass has lasted the, the hundreds and hundreds of years uh, since its initial installment. And it, when it gets replaced, a lot of times the modern stained glass methods allow for larger panels to be put in place. But to be sure that you're looking at the original stained glass, you'll find a lot of these itty bitty little pieces of glass because at the time, the technology they had available uh, allowed that much to be accomplished. That being said, just being able to, to create stained glass is a huge technological achievement in itself. It's a very, very exacting process. So, Notre Dame. This is for specifically Notre Dame de Paris, the one in Paris, which again means our mother, as was explained in one of the previous presentations. Now, we see here a fairly impressive uh, rose window. Um, but what really makes Notre Dame look like Notre Dame are these things sticking out of the sides. And you'll read about these uh, in the corresponding information below. These are the flying buttresses, which I agree is a funny word, funny combination of word. But this is just an evolution of uh, that form of buttress that we were looking at during the Romanesque period. It's a structural support. And without these things, it would have been absolutely impossible for Gothic structures to be as tall and slender as they were. Um, a lot of times, uh, Gothic structures collapsed upon themselves during the construction process, especially when they started to put the roofs on it. Uh, the roof pushing down on the wall caused them to bow out. And with these buttresses leaning against the walls, kind of pushing them back in, it allows the walls themselves to support a tremendous amount more weight than they would without the buttressing. The buttressing was just, it's a structural support. And uh, initially, um, they would have sca systems of scaffolding alongside, and the scaffolding would be what would hold them in place, but eventually they would take the scaffolding down, and then you were left with a very tall, thin structure with, you know, very thin walls that was just inches away from collapsing on itself. Um, the buttresses allow these things to be very light in appearance, almost spindly. Um, that's done intentionally. They, they were trying to convey that the structures themselves are almost miraculous. They, there's a description of, of them from uh, the Gothic period uh, saying that they appeared as if they were suspended from the heavens by invisible threads. Because if you compare this to the earlier style Romanesque churches, um, they're not totally different, but they do look a lot lighter and a lot thinner, like they're almost defying gravity itself. So, Saint-Chapelle is, in my opinion, just the best version of Gothic architecture. Uh, I had the, the opportunity to visit this a couple of summers ago, and just the, the attention to detail... Um, the presence of light, um, the, just the sheer beauty of the structure was an absolutely amazing experience. It was legitimately jaw-dropping just to see uh, how much was going on inside of this one. And it's not a large chapel, but if as a Gothic architect you're trying to design a tall and slender structure with as much, many windows as possible, this is it. This is as much as you can get. It is, it is absolutely jaw-dropping. All right, from here, we've got a continuation of the illuminated manuscripts that have been mentioned before. Um, uh, de further development of marginalia, Celtic animal style. A lot of what's mentioned before uh, just continues in earnest. And then we have, well, this is basically a reference to the Black Death. I've typed out a lot about that, so just read about that below. What you do need to know specifically is about this one guy, Giotto. Giotto was initially self-taught. He was a shepherd who taught himself how to draw from observation. Duccio, who we have here, 
trained him to become a professional artist, but he became an inspiration for the artist during the Renaissance. That's very important.